Debbie and I went to Orange City, Iowa, on Friday to visit for her Northwestern College. See if that might be somewhere she'd want to go to school next year. And as far as I can tell, it's a great college, so it's a possibility. But anyway, one of the things you do on those visit days is go to chapel. So we went to chapel, and he reads the scripture. The Good Samaritan said, I studied this this week. Pretty amazing how that works. I, I'm actually giving mine. Hopefully the Lord, what he had to share was good. Well, let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that we can open up your word again today and you continue to teach us. So we invite you now, Holy Spirit, to do the work in our hearts, to help us to to have ears to hear and a heart to, to listen to what you want to say to us. For this is a very important message, as it always is, as we look at your word. We're so thankful for the privilege we have today to open up your Bible together. And so we ask for your blessing that you would multiply this time and be our teacher today. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What the lawyer asked Jesus in Luke 10.25 is perhaps the most important question any of us can ask. What shall I do to have eternal life? It seems that this was a very important question in Jesus' day. We're going to talk about it in a moment, but the person we often think of as the rich young ruler will ask the same question in Luke 18. And that really helps us to understand both the question and Jesus' answer. answer. But let me just ask you, How would you answer that question? If someone were to come up to you today and say, how do I inherit eternal life, what would you say to them? If they came up and said, I see you are different, I see you have hope and joy and love, and whatever it is you have, I want that for my life. What would you say to them? One of our goals here at Victor Road Evangelical Free Church is that every person who calls this church their church home would be able to answer that question adequately. That we would know how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone. We recognize that not everyone has the gift of evangelism. But we can all be ready to give a defense of the hope that is within us to be able to share the gospel of Jesus as God gives opportunity. You know, really all we need to say, and there's the gospel is more than just one sentence, but yet all we really need to be able to say is that response that Paul and Silas gave to the Philippian jailer When the jailer asked them, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Everyone, whatever your training, whatever your background, as long as you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can answer, you can tell someone how to to know Jesus. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Now this is not the answer that Jesus gives. It's very interesting to study what Jesus says here in Luke 10. As Jesus often does, 
he responds to the lawyer's question with another question. And in verse 26, he says, the, the Bible reads, He said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And the lawyer responds by giving Jesus the two main points of the Old Testament law, which Jesus himself has used in responding to this kind of question. These verses summarize, really, the Old Testament, the law, and the prophets. They come from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, 18. Luke 10, 27 reads, and he answered, now this is the lawyer speaking, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. It's a great answer especially for a Jew in that day who seeks to follow God. And Jesus, knowing the heart of this man, and that's very important, Jesus responds in verse 28, and he says to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Well, the question before us, is what does Jesus mean by that? Do this and you will live. Because beyond that, can anyone fully keep those commandments? Can anyone perfectly keep the commandments of God? Can anyone perfectly love God and his neighbor? Can therefore anyone inherit eternal life or go to heaven on their own because they keep all of the commandments perfectly? If these are a summation of the Old Testament law and the prophets, can we do that? Jesus says, do this and you will live. Well, the lawyer thinks he's doing pretty well. He had answered Jesus in the right way. He, he does love God in some way. He loves his fellow Israelites. But he also knows, as we can assume, I believe Jesus knows, that there's an issue here. There's an issue for the lawyer. Because the Jews usually consider their neighbor as their fellow Israelites. One commentator writes, according to the Halakha, which is the Jewish law, an Israelite's neighbor is any member of his nation, but not one who is not an Israelite. And so this is why, for instance, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 43 and 44, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's with the restricted usage of the word neighbor. But I say to you, love your enemy. Jesus expands on the definition of who is your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you. The lawyer knows there's an issue in his own heart, but he wants to be justified. He wants to be right in God's eyes, and so the lawyer asked Jesus, in trying to justify himself, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor, Jesus? You know, so many people today are trying to justify themselves. They're trying to earn their way to God. They're trying to say, I'm good enough for God to accept me on my own. And we would have to say that in most cases, most of us here this morning, perhaps all of us, or many people that we know are good people. We haven't murdered anyone. 
We haven't been involved in human trafficking like some people. We're not terrorists. We're good people, aren't we? But throughout the gospel, we see Jesus raising the standard, the standard of goodness of what it would take to be able to inherit eternal life. And what Jesus, I believe, is doing here and in many other places in the Gospels, Jesus continues to show us that on our own, we can't make it to heaven. We'll never be good enough. Though we have done some good things in our lives, and maybe compared to some, we might be considered good people. None of us are perfect. And therefore, on our own, because we are all sinners, none of us can make it to heaven. And we see through the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus shows him his heart is not right before God. He can't make it on his own. Now, this parable that Jesus tells, this story, may have come from experiences that people had on the Jericho Road from Jerusalem. This road was about 17 miles long. It went through a lot of hills and dark places, and it was not somewhere you really wanted to travel alone, especially at night. You'd hear stories of robberies and people being beaten, the money being taken. Kind of like Central Park is a nice place to visit in New York City, but don't go there alone, especially at night. It would be like that. But in the parable, we have this man, and we don't know his identity. Jesus give, doesn't give us a lot of details. But this man is robbed and beaten. And he's left on the road for dead. And he tells us in the parable that three men pass by him on the road. The first is a priest. The second is a Levite, both religious leaders. Now, there's debate on why these leaders may have purposely passed by this man. Jesus doesn't tell us there is the possibility that they didn't want to become unclean. They thought the man was dead. They didn't want to handle his body. And because of their responsibilities, they chose to pass him by. We can't be sure. But it's not critical, as with many of the parables, to, to know or understand the whys and wherefores of all of the details. We only know, and all we need to know, is they were religious men who claimed to have a relationship with God. And for whatever reason, these men choose to ignore this man who had been beaten, robbed, left for dead. But then we have the third man, this Samaritan man. And the scripture tells us that he felt compassion for the man who had been beaten and left for dead on the road. Jesus uses this same word, compassion, when he tells the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. You may remember the the prodigal son had gone off, he'd spent everything he had, he was destitute, he starts coming back. And the scripture tells us that the father has compassion for the prodigal son. And he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. We also know that Jesus is described as having compassion for the widow at nine. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Her son had died. Jesus has compassion for her. And we know he responds by raising him from the dead. We're talking about that same word here. The Samaritan had compassion and he acted. 
on this feeling. He acted immediately. Verses 34 and 35 tell us the Samaritan now goes the extra mile. He goes beyond what we would consider as normal to try and care for this man who had been beaten and left for dead. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. He put him on his own beast, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. And so the Samaritan doesn't just get off his donkey and, and stop and say, Are you okay? Okay. And, and go on about his way. No, he stops. Whatever he's doing, he uses his own resources, the oil and and wine. He bandages this man, perhaps using part of his own clothing. Puts him on his own beast. So now the Samaritan doesn't have anyone to ride himself. And takes him to an inn. He doesn't just drop him off and say, I'm busy, I'm going to go on down the road. But he stays with him the remainder of the day. And then the next day, he takes money, pays for two days' wages worth of care to the innkeeper. And basically says, here's my credit card. Whatever you need, whatever this man needs to be taken care of, do it for him. I will repay you when I come back through again. Now, Jesus is finished with the story, and he asks the lawyer, which of these three, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hand? Well, it's kind of obvious, right? The lawyer gets it right. Verse 37 reads, and he said, the one who showed mercy for him. Notice something very important here. What does the lawyer not say? He doesn't say the Samaritan. He says the one. That guy. He doesn't even want to speak the name Samaritan. In this story, Jesus being a Jewish rabbi, one would expect that the hero would have been a Jew. Maybe one of the religious leaders. Let's bump these guys up who we supposedly respect in our culture. But in no way would a Jewish listener hearing a Jewish rabbi expect the protagonist to be a Samaritan. The Samaritans were basically enemies of the Jews. They were considered traitors and what we might say is half-breeds who took advantage of the exiles to come in and marry. One commentator writes, according to the ideas of Jewish religious leaders at the time, the commandments of love for one's neighbors related only to persons belonging to one's own blood, pure Jews and therefore not the Gentiles or Samaritans. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus, however, teaches explicitly that love for one's neighbor knows no bounds of nationality or anything else, no matter what. And so the righteous man, being a Samaritan in this parable, would have cut into the lawyer's heart and would have showed him his own reality, which Jesus already knew, because he knew the heart of the lawyer. It's why he's telling the parable that, yes, this lawyer may try and love his fellow Israelites, but he didn't have love for non-Jews like Samaritans. The man had asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
And then who is my neighbor? And through this parable, Jesus says to the lawyer and to us, to inherit eternal life, you must love God and love your neighbor, love all people perfectly. He says in verse 28, do this and you will live. You will have eternal life. Sometimes it's easy to forget that Jesus is still teaching here under the Old Testament system of law. Now we see throughout the Gospels, he often speaks of the kingdom of God to come, the future, the coming kingdom, the way of salvation what he would do on the cross. But right now as he's teaching, we're kind of at that crossing point, and he still will refer to the Old Testament law, and we see it here again. But like I believe in the Sermon on the Mount and many other places that Jesus teaches, what he is saying is, because we can't follow the Old Testament law perfectly, which is summarized in love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Since we can't follow that perfectly, there is no way on our own we can have eternal life. But Jesus tells the lawyer in verse 37, go and do the same. The lawyer knows he doesn't have the capacity that in his own heart. Now one of the ways that we can understand this better is we can look at Luke 18 and see what Jesus does there, and we don't have time this morning to spend as much time there as we did here. But in Luke 18, we have Jesus in the conversation with who we call the rich young ruler, And after the ruler asked Jesus in verse 18, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus again points this man to the law. And in the end, Jesus knows that this rich young ruler struggles with greed and with possession. And so what does he say that we sometimes get confused with to the rich young ruler? He says... Go and sell all your possessions. Again, like in Luke 10 with the Good Samaritan parable, here Jesus is telling the rich young ruler something to do which was basically impossible. There was no way on his own he would have a right heart before God. And we see this in so much of Jesus' teachings in the Gospels. He is setting us up, even as I believe Paul does in Romans 1 to 3, till the transition in verses 23 and 24 in Romans, to show us that all of us are lost on our own, that we can't fulfill the law. And that's why we need the sacrifice the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The only way we can inherit eternal life is through receiving Jesus as our Savior. We can't do it on our own. And so we come to that place where we have to ask the question of ourselves, Am I trying to get to heaven on my own? Am I trying to obtain eternal life by being a good person? By going to church? By helping the poor and the needy? By giving money to charity? By doing what's right? Even what's religious? But throughout the Bible we continue to see that we can never do enough on our own because we all are tainted with sin. We will never be pure or holy and therefore we cannot achieve salvation on our own. 
That's what Jesus is teaching. Throughout the Scriptures, we see that the only way we can have eternal life is by the grace of God, and it's the, all the sacrifices from the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ's death on the cross that now we can know with full confidence that it is through the Lamb of God who gave His life for us, through Jesus Christ, that we can have eternal life. Not by our own works, but by His work on the cross. By believing in Jesus, we have eternal life. John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. This life is in His Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. And so in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus is teaching us we can never do enough to obtain eternal life on our own. We can only have eternal life through the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. I think also there's another aspect of this parable. Maybe one that we're more used to in thinking about the Good Samaritan. Because this parable addresses not only that we must rely upon God's mercy for eternal life, but that we should therefore show God's mercy to others. Now again, what we saw in the Good Samaritan is that we will never have that perfect compassion and love for the needy. We all still struggle with selfishness and sin on our own. But because of Jesus, what He's done for us on the cross, and now because of the challenge He gives the lawyer, and therefore us, to go and do likewise. Though we will never do it perfectly, we should look for opportunities to consistently share the mercy and compassion and love of God with those around us who are needy. Because of all of the Bible, because of all of the Gospel, Christians should be the most giving and compassionate and needy people in all of the world because that mercy, that, that desire to give and share with others comes from what God has done for us. When we reflect upon the mercy of God for us through Jesus Christ, we should want to be helpful people. We should want to be compassionate people. And Jesus has said, go and do the same. Be good Samaritans. And we do that because of what he's done for us. God has always called his people to be compassionate to the poor and needy. We see that throughout the Bible. Speaking of the righteous king in Psalm 72, verse 13, the Bible reads, "He will." this is speaking of the king, he will have compassion on the poor and needy and the lives of the needy he will save. Proverbs 14, 21 reads, He who despises his neighbor sin, but happy is he who is gracious to the poor. Paul writes in Galatians 2, 10, They only ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. And so I believe one of the applications of reading through the Good Samaritan is for us to say, what would it look like for us to be like the Good Samaritan? What would it look for us to say, how do I go and do the same to minister to people People I don't even know, but people who have needs. We don't even know maybe why they're on the road, but they have needs. And I want to share the love and compassion of God with them. We must make sure, because of God's call throughout all of the scriptures, to fight for the needs of the poor to show his compassion and mercy we 
can't do everything, but we can do something. We can do something. And so we must continue to seek to show mercy and love and compassion to needy in our own community and needy throughout the world. And so we take a passage like this and we meditate upon the scriptures and we say then, how does this relate to the issue like immigration that is so important in our culture today? We have to be in on the debate as Christians. How do we deal with issues such as human trafficking in our culture and world today? Even an issue like health care. We can't just set that aside. We should enter the debate and say, what should that look like for the poor and needy in our culture today? Are there areas where the church must intervene? We must have a seat at the table and take a stand because God calls us to go and do the same. Even if it means going against the grain of our culture, even if it means breaking the laws of our culture. Because first and foremost, we are to follow Christ. Quite often, though sometimes not as often or as urgently as we should, the church has fought for justice and mercy for the helpless, for the abused, on a variety of issues. The church was involved in slavery issues. The church has been involved in the issue of abortion. We continue to fight against that. The church has taken up issues concerning the poor and responded with, with things like soup kitchens and hospitals and different missions and clinics. We have organizations like the Salvation Army and Samaritan's Purse and World Vision and Prison Fellowship which are fighting for the poor and the needy in our culture and around the world. These organizations are not only offering help for the physical needs and the emotional needs, but what makes them a Christian organization is we are coming alongside these people and also sharing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe it is so important that we not only care for the physical needs, but we make sure that we offer the help with the spiritual needs most importantly, their eternal life. But we must continue. Why do we do this? Do we do this out of our own goodness? Because we're nice people? Well, ultimately, we should do this because we've experienced the mercy of God ourselves. And as well, we want to walk in obedience and thanksgiving to show mercy to others. That's how we are to be a good Samaritan. To respond to what God has done for us and walk in obedience to Him to help those who can't help themselves. And I'm so thankful that this congregation has already been involved in those kinds of tasks like, again, the offering we took up just over a few weeks to help with the refugees in Europe who have cried out with need. And we were able to raise up $2,600 to send to help. And that's why now we want to get involved with the Angel Tree Ministry. We don't know these people. But we see a need and we want to minister to these hurting people. And 
so we need people in our own congregation to take a stand and to sign up in the foyer and say, I too want to walk as a good Samaritan. I can't do everything, but I can do something. I can go and shop to encourage a child whose dad is in prison, or I can go and visit that family and share the gospel with them and show the love of Christ. And as we begin to think about this holiday season, both Thanksgiving and Christmas, we can continue to ask God, Lord, teach us because of your mercy and love to look for ways around us that we can be good Samaritans and walk in the power of His Spirit and share the love of the Gospel with people who are in need. And so, because of what Christ has done for us, let us seek to be good Samaritans and show His love and goodness to the poor and the needy around us. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for Your goodness to us. In many ways, we were like that man on the road. On our own, destitute. We had been robbed and beaten by the devil. We had been abused. We had nowhere to go. We could do nothing ourselves. And in so many ways, you were like the Good Samaritan. You came and picked us up when we could do nothing ourselves, and you brought us to the Father. And you've healed us. You've saved us. And we're so thankful today. We give you praise and we worship you and we we exalt you, O King. Thanks for saving me. Thank you for your mercy in my life. And so, Lord, as the heart of thanksgiving and obedience to your command to go and do the same, help me, help all of us to look for those opportunities around us to share your love and goodness, to bind up the wounded, to encourage the brokenhearted, to physically, emotionally, spiritually help those who have great need. Continue to guide and lead us as a congregation and how to do that as well. Because we do, Lord, want to go. And we want to be good Samaritans to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray.